for centuries, Ladakh was its own kingdom, its own country, almost for a thousand years. A Buddhist kingdom high in the Himalayas with little in common with those you know, in the sweltering plains of India or in the foothills. This was its own country, its own place. Today, it is an integral part of the Republic of India. In fact, it's one part of one state in the Republic of India. But that wasn't inevitable. Ladakh, of course, historically, the precedent was there for Ladakh to be independent. Uh, Pakistan would make a bid at Ladakh. Even China may have ended up with Ladakh. So how did it become a part of India? And how did it become not just a part of India, but just one part, an unnamed part of one state, the state of Jammu and Kashmir? It's not Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, even though Ladakh geographically is the largest part of the state. It's just Jammu and Kashmir. So how did that happen? A Ladakhi polity was first established in the 900s when a branch of the old Tibetan royal house, the Tibetan Empire had fallen several decades before in the mid 800s. And a branch of that house had survived, migrated west with a bunch of aristocracy and they established a state here that would come to envelop what is today Ladakh. 500 years later, that state was still around, a Ladakhi state. And it's around that time, so we're talking the 1400s, that the first Muslim incursions begin to take place. These are armed incursions from Kashmir to the west. Eventually, Baltistan will also convert for the most part and also serve as a base for raids. Uh, the Islamic faith system will also make incursions less coercively in western Ladakh, uh, in the Kargil area. Much of, of, of that area is now majority Muslim today. And, uh, you know, this will be a constant danger. By the late 1500s, the Ladakhi kings will have become pretty good at holding off these incursions, but it doesn't last. Around 1600, you have a devastating raid from the west. Uh, lots of destruction, looting, killing, burning. Uh, but still, even with that, and uh, after the departure of these raiding armies, these incursions, um, the Ladakhi state has survived. Uh, the Ladakhi people, their culture, their way of life, their religion, continues to survive in relative isolation. But instead of getting better, things got worse. By the 1700s, you had two powers. The Mughals on one side and the Tibetans on the other, pulling political strings in Ladakh. Both considered Ladakh its vassal. So that's always a problem. Didn't help that Ladakh had no real army at this point, and its monarchy was in shambles. And the royal family was, I mean, they were fighting amongst themselves, there was intrigue, there were assassinations, uh, plenty of unfit rulers, people, you know, rulers dying young, rulers who are mentally unstable or mad. Uh, all of this makes Ladakh ripe for the plucking. And, uh, you know, in 1819, the Dogras had captured Kashmir, taken over Kashmir for the Sikh state of Ranjit Singh. Fifteen years later, they marched into Ladakh. And Ladakh was a pretty easy conquest at this point. So the Dogras, uh, the forces of Gulab Singh, vassal, of the Sikh state, conquered Ladakh. We're talking, keep in mind, the mid 1800s here. Okay, so this is after almost a thousand years of independence or, or of the existence of a, an independent or mostly independent Ladakhi state, mid 1800s. A few years later, the British defeated the Sikhs, which meant that the British now controlled all of the territory that the Sikhs had once controlled. And that included, of course, Ladakh. Now, had the British defeated the Sikhs 10 years earlier, Ladakh would not have been part of their winnings. But it just so happened that things were timed just right for the British and for Ladakh's inclusion in what would eventually be the British Raj system. Now, the British allowed Gulab Singh, who was already the Maharaja of Jammu, to go on and govern Kashmir, which now included Ladakh, thanks to the Dogra conquest just a few years earlier. So now, you've got this princely state called Kashmir and Jammu, the princely state of Kashmir and Jammu, which actually is mostly made up not of Jammu or Kashmir, but of Ladakh. And that continues to this day. When independence comes, uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir will be born, named after the princely state of Kashmir and Jammu. And to this day in India, the state of Jammu and Kashmir is made up mostly of Ladakh. 
This is a completely ahistorical conglomeration and something that's relatively recent, especially considering Ladakh's almost thousand year independent history as its own co country. Now, as, as recent as the 1980s and early 1990s, there has been some violence in Ladakh over this strange political arrangement. But as of the filming of this video, Ladakh continues to be lumped together with Kashmir and, of all places, Jammu. So the Dogras conquered Ladakh as agents of the Sikh state. Then the British conquered the Sikhs. Then the British appointed Gulab Singh, Raja of Jammu, to govern Kashmir which, by a recent twist of fate, now also included Ladakh. Okay, so it seems obvious now how Ladakh became a part of India. But actually, in 1947, when independence came, things were far from certain, because Ladakh was connected to Kashmir, and Kashmir is Muslim majority, and Pakistan was theoretically created as a Muslim homeland. And so, you know, many feared in Ladakh that they'd end up with Pakistan. They'd end up wherever Kashmir ended up. Meanwhile, no one knew, you know, where Kashmir would end up. Many Kashmiris probably would have chosen independence if they'd ever really had a choice. But in any case, it was unclear. While the Maharaja was sort of dilly-dallying, trying to make a choice here, fighters from Pakistan streamed over into Kashmir and into Western Ladakh to ensure that this territory would end up in Pakistani hands. These raiders from Pakistan took Kargil. They took Zanskar. Some of them even made it all the way here to the Leh area, right, right in central Ladakh, the heart and capital of Ladakh. Ultimately, though, they'd be pushed back. Uh, Indian forces would arrive, made up in, in large part of Gurkhas, and locals would help. Uh, they were saved by the building of an airfield by the first Ladakhi to ever be educated overseas. He'd happened to have chosen engineering, which proved critical. But in any case, when the dust settled, uh, the Pakistanis were able to take Baltistan and a slice of Kashmir, but Ladakh was part of India. It should be remembered too that there was a sizable Muslim minority, even here in central Ladakh, even here in Leh, a sizable Muslim minority, and tensions were high between the Muslim minority and the Buddhist majority. But unlike in other parts of India, where between 200,000 and 2 million people were killed in communal violence during partition. Here in Ladakh, that was not the case. Luckily, no violence broke out. But Ladakh didn't become a household name for most Indians until 1962, when China invaded Ladakh and occupied the Aksai Chin Plateau, very high altitude plateau. The Chinese saw it as a crucial connector, probably, between Tibet, recently occupied Tibet, and long occupied East Turkestan, or what the Chinese called Xinjiang. Okay, so that was what the Aksai Chin was to them. Now the Ladakhis fought hard, but to no avail, and uh, the Chinese held on to the Aksai Chin, much to the chagrin of Indian nationalists everywhere. And that's the state of things to this day. This continues to be a disputed border between China and India. China continues to control it. And I think most Indians expect at some point in the future a uh, re-flaring up of a border war with China. But it put Ladakh on the map in the minds of many Indians. It also had another impact that probably forever cemented Ladakh with India. And that is, it led to a you know, sort of a heavy militarization of the region. The Indian military is everywhere here. There are bases all over the place, soldiers all over the place, and you know they've been largely integrated into the local economy. But China glued Ladakh to India in a couple other ways as well. First, by occupying Tibet and Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, China, or the modern Chinese state, cut off the traditional trade routes that Ladakh had enjoyed with Central Asia and with Tibet. We're talking thousand-year-old trade routes at least, maybe 1,500 year old trade routes. Some of them connecting to what had once been called the Silk Road. Well, these were still being used right up to the occupation of these two massive areas by the People's Republic of China. Today, Ladakh is much more economically faced, obviously, towards India. Second, by occupying Tibet, the Chinese had cut off 
the old religious institutional ties between Ladakh and Tibet. Okay, these are many centuries old. Today, Ladakhis still send novices to be trained in Tibetan monasteries, but those monasteries are not in Tibet. They're in India. Okay, so the Sikh state had lumped Ladakh in with Kashmir and Jammu. Then the British roped all that territory in with Greater British India. Then India had pushed out the Pakistanis and ensured that that area would be part of independent India. And then China, unwittingly, had cemented Ladakh's place as a part of India, whether for good or for real.